This podcast is brought to you by Underwriters Laboratory, Workplace Health and Safety. So the first title we're going to release is more informational for organizations, and it's really designed to help educate the entire population related to the new view of safety. So we get into looking at how the best-in-class organizations are utilizing these techniques to drive improvement, but ultimately set up the rest of the content that will be coming online at the end of the first quarter. This first module will be available for free, and uh, we'll announce soon when you're able to access that content as well as where. Thank you. All this cool stuff's available at Underwriters Laboratory, WorkplaceHealthAndSafety.com. Think about it, you guys. They're great sponsors, and thank you for doing that. And now, let's get on with the podcast. <laughs> They had the pilots, they had the passengers, they had the aircraft, they had everything there, except the thing that caused it. That had disappeared as if by magic. everybody, welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm your host today, Todd Conklin, and you're in for a treat today, I think. We'll see if this all works. It's technically a mess, but you know, I'm never afraid of a technical mess, that's for sure. Everything's great here. I hope you're doing good. Um, the podcast is just rocking and rolling. Thanks for all your feedback, everything you're saying, all the good things that are happening. I really appreciate it. It's, um, you know, it, the year's zooming by. And my whole premise of slowing things down, I've already told you I'm just, I'm a mess. I cannot do that. But other than that, I would say it's a really good year. Tons and tons of interesting stuff. So today is a really interesting podcast. I'm going to jump right into it because uh, I think you'll like today. It, it's going to be really interesting. I, I spoke at a meeting uh, in Denmark with uh, Oil and Gas Denmark, uh, and uh, I got to speak with a guy named Peter Burkle. And I, I actually asked him if I could record his presentation because he told the story of his plane crash. And Peter's really a great guy. In fact, we can talk to him a lot more. If you, if you want to hear more, I'm, I'm more than happy to get a hold of him and, and get him on board. He was flying for British Airways. He was on Flight 38. Uh, the call sign for that plane, which you just heard in the opening of this uh, podcast, is Speedbird 38. And they were doing a normal old flight from Beijing to London. On October 17th, 2008, and at about noon, 1230 really, his Boeing 777 crash landed at the opening apron um, to the runway. Um, They'd done the whole entire flight. I mean, the entire whole flight and got to the point where the plane was just right at the apron of the of uh, Heathrow and and it had fuel starvation and it crashed, and nobody died. In fact, 152 people were on board, and n- nobody died. It's a remarkable failure, and it's a failure that I don't know how much you heard about or not. And what's interesting about Pete, and he's going to tell the story of, of this event and how it feels to him, is that it had nothing to do at all with operator error. Nothing. but No pilot error at all. In fact, what happened is the plane formed its own kind of slush puppy, its own its own slush sickle, and had fuel starvation, and they brought it in as carefully and as safely and without the least amount of impact they could possibly have into this airport. And I want you to hear Peter tell that story. And so let me cut away now and play Peter Burkle at Oil & Gas Denmark 2016. I think you're going to enjoy what Pete has to say. Listen carefully. It's a, a pretty cool little conversation. Until then, more on the backside. This is me, Pete Burkle. Um, and as it says there, I was the captain of, of this BA-38. Back in January 2008, it was actually 12.41, PM on a cold January day. I remember it well. Uh, briefly, actually, Martin's, Martin's told me a little bit about himself, um, education, um, how I got into flying, trained at Presswick, Scotland, uh, joined British Airways in 1989 after having been a, 
a mini lab sales rep for two years with Kodak UK. Now I'm just waiting for flying to start really. And um, yeah, drawing BA 1989, uh, so Clue, TriStar, uh, Lockheed L1011s for a couple of years. Um, went to fly for Q8 Airways to help them out after the war. Um, back, started flying DC 10s for about five years. Loved those aircraft, really. And then I joined the Boeing 777, which is, uh, well, that's a sad looking one in the picture, but uh, that's a 777. I started flying those in 96, um, so 18 years ago. Can't believe they're that old. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've done um, actually 27 years now, of course, giving you the wrong info there, but 27 years flying, 17,500 flying hours. Oh, I remember most of them. <coughs> so, during those 27 years, I've, I've obviously experienced uh, a number of events. You, you know, you, you've got to imagine all these, I'm sure you will fly. Um, yeah, you will do because you're working for. Oh my god. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> actually, just out of interest, how many of you remember? Because I've, I've been talking to a number of people today and I've come across three people who actually know who I am and, and this, they remember this event. But I don't know how many, a little show of hands, how many people in the, in the room actually remember this event? Because it's. Oh, okay, cool. Sorry, you're going to get bored then because this is just about that. Um, the rest of you, the rest of you might uh, might enjoy this then. Um, so this is what I'm here to do today to talk to you about. It's a, it's a true event. Um, I was the captain on this flight, as it says, and we suffered uh, an unknown event. Uh, short finals over London. Uh, we were about um, 1,500 feet when the event started. Uh, fully configured for landing and we started getting uh, some unknown events happening. It was unprecedented in aviation and unfortunately they had me at the controls. Um, I am your average employee. Um, I score middle of the lines, maybe just above average, but they probably would have preferred to have their ace there, but they had me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll tell you later on how I felt, but it, it's... <coughs> Certainly, to have that um, thrust on you uh, with no no extra time to, to be able to add on was uh, was stressful, so at least. Um, but me and the team, we 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 worked together. David would be proud of that. I said we straight away, not not me, not I, they, whatever, but me, and we. Um, anyway, I had very little time to deal with this. Um, sometimes you don't quite know what what life's going to throw at you. Um, Gordon mentioned earlier when I got Gordon talked about zero injuries, zero casualties I was like that once I, I had zero, zero in my personal logbook unfortunately now it's about 21 injuries and zero casualties so that answers one thing there were no casualties on this event which, which was great, the, apart from the aircraft that was written off but <laughs> I've got 21 injuries and zero casualties the first injury I had was a do this uh, over the Rockies, and we hit uh, severe turbulence and that massive pocket just out of blue. And she was in the back galley, and she just got airborne and smashed her head on the way down on a on a lock on the side of a canister. I, sat, I heard about it in the front, like, oh my god, is she okay? Well, we don't know. She's she sat down. I uh, said, so we've got a We've got a paramedic, ex paramedic, haven't we? One of the crew. She said, Get her on casement. That's her. <laughs> so that, that was one of my um, one of my first uh, diversions for a long time. Actually, that was only about five years ago, and um, I felt very bad for her because she she was in a bad way, vomiting, and I thought yeah, she's got some bad injuries. So we we elected to get her on the ground as soon as possible, and uh, we got the ambulance to meet her. She's fine now, but. Um, She's a tough cookie. But yeah, typical, isn't it? When you want your, your paramedic crew, that was her. <laughs> what happens to normal flight preparation? Um, this is actually, this is a 777 arriving at Gatwick, actually. This was my first retirement flight. Doesn't sound right, does it? My first retirement flight. But I, I retired at the BA after this flight, uh, incidentally. 
So that's quite a quite a nice photo for me. It's a lovely blue sunny day at Gatwick. So once once the flight arrives, like there's um, obviously all the passengers disembarked and we've got off. Then the next crew were already getting ready to prepare that aircraft to move on. So in Beijing, uh, the flight arrived um, on time, I think, um, and it would have been prepared for getting ready, prepared for departure. So uh, the first people get on normally with the cleaners. They're, they're usually waiting for the crew to get off, so they'll be on straight away to clean all the mess, no, all the rubbish from the previous customers. And um, they never clean the flight deck, actually. But that's for us to do. So they clean all, all the rubbish, then you've got the flight engineer, the, the ground engineers come on board, they will check the tech locks and they'll mend anything that's gone, gone wrong on route. So IFE equipment from, from the first class passengers who've been using it wrong. Um, <laughs> and hopefully they'll mend any big issues that we've got in our yellow pages up front, which I always think far more important than the pink ones down the back. So they they mend our aircraft if there's anything uh, anything wrong with it, and they'll change. Uh, well, the water waste will be removed, of course. They'll top up the fresh water tanks. Uh, they'll check the hydraulics. They'll probably start on the fueling before we get there. Um, that's all done within about the first 40 minutes, and they'll be aiming to look at turning this aircraft around in about an hour and a half. Then we arrive flight crew arrive at the airfield about an hour to go hopefully get on board the aircraft with a good 45 minutes to go and then we start doing our briefings now in the old days, in these days in Beijing we still have paper paper briefings, nowadays it's all on the laptops and we can have a look at that before we get to the aircraft, so that saves time nowadays, but in those days it was paper briefing and we'd have, we'd have checked all that it would have information about the whole route um, not only the weather at Beijing where we were taking off from, but we have the information of all the airfields en route that we might need to use for the paramedic stewardess who's knocked her head. Um, so we have all the weathers for those, and of course, more importantly, everyone wants to get to destination, so we'd have the destination weather for London Heathrow, and we'll be looking at that. And it was, it was not a bad day actually, either end, it was about minus two in Beijing. 10 northerly wind, um, slight light snow shower, I believe, I remember. So it was a cold, wintry day. Um, London was a dry January, cold, blustery day, but no precipitation forecast. So it looked pretty good either end. Our big issue for the briefing, or as David says, <coughs> certification, we, we still call them briefings. Um, but we, we cover his requirements for certification quite interesting. I listened to his, his uh, speech very very interestingly because his certification was, was basically our briefing that we do in certainly in British Airways. Basically there's no closed questions. We'd never ask, well, as a captain I'd never say, so are you happy with 80 tons then for this route? Yeah, you, you've got to you've got to generate that training in, in your first officer so you're, you're always asking them questions what would you do, how would you do that, which buttons are you going to press if this happens and it's, it's very much an open briefing um, so that's like David's David uh, Market's uh, certification but we still call them briefings, I think it's a easy word to say um, yeah, we do a lot of touch drills as well in that. Um, I think he, I think he mentioned about about doing touch drills. We we still do touch drills, and we we certainly wouldn't move anything without someone else's um, someone else's nod, basically. So if I went to press a button in flight, I, sh I should have my hand slapped uh, in an emergency from my co-pilot, and I'd, I'd, he'd be quite right to do that. And I'd go, sorry, was I touching something without? without asking. So it's all very much in, in commercial flying, it's very much um, I do, he follows, he copies, he you know, he monitors what I'm doing. It's, it's very much a two-man show. Um, so yeah, the briefing is over, then we decide on the fuel. Um, we don't just fill them up. We don't take as much as much fuel as we can. We could fit about 120 
thousand kilograms of fuel. I don't know what you guys deal in. I um, don't know how many, how many barrels that is, but <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, 120,000 kilograms would fill up the 777, mm-hmm. but that would be um, far too much fuel. That would be about a 13 and a half hour flight. We only had a 10 and a half hour flight. So we, we elected to take uh, minimum fuel, which was about 80,000 80, tonnes. So it's about two thirds full. But it was cold fuel. This is important for later on. It's a cold day, and the fuel on the ground was cold. So I think I remember looking at the fuel gauge and the temperature on the ground when it filled us up with 80 tonnes. The fuel temperature was already about minus one. So that was already quite, quite cold for a, for a refill. Uh, then what happened with um, someone walked around the outside, one of us guys, check, uh, check everything's where it should be, kick the tires, you know, <laughs> usual things. <laughs> Get back in, uh, I'd like to be sat in my seat with 30 minutes to go, 30 minutes before departure, and then start loading the flight management computers, uh, just checking the route between us. Uh, co pilot will be doing the performance for takeoff. So we've got enough power to actually get airborne, which is quite important really. <laughs> so that needs to be calculated. So all that's done, and then 20 minutes to go, I'd like to be ready to brief. For the, not, not the briefing for the route, so we've done that. This is another brief, another certification. This one's about emergencies. And this is where you, you talk about what's going to happen if we lose an engine on departure. What are you going to do? Where's the safe place to go? So we talk about all that probably about 10, 15 minutes of emergency briefings, and five minutes to go, run the first checklist, quick PA to passengers, and we're off. That's it. You can all do that now. <laughs> so on the, on the day, I just had to say we did depart one minute late, but that's actually classed us on time. So that was good. So we set off on route. Um, I dropped this basic route for you last week. Um, it's basically a great circle route, and we, we try to follow that with flight planning as much as possible. So Beijing, obviously, on the far right hand side, destination, far left. That route, 5,000 miles, should take about 10 and a half hours on the day. So I think, was it, was it David who was talking about the Navy? Yeah, it was the Navy SEALs. What's he up there? Yes, body deteriorating. So now, this is a sort of body deteriorating flight for the Navy SEALs, I reckon. You know, they'd, they'd be... They'd be wasted, wouldn't they? They'd be wasting away by the time we got to London. <laughs> it explains a lot about me, actually. <laughs> I used to be in the UC, I reckon. Um, so, yeah, 10 half hour flight, 5,000 miles, 136 customers on board, 13 cabin crew, 3 flight crew. So, I was in command of all that rabble. Uh, two first officers with me up front looking after me. And, uh, and I always say they're looking after me because I, I'm in command. Um, European legislation calls me a commander now, not a captain, but so I'm a commander. That's weird. Um, commander Bob. Yeah, that's <laughs> So, captain, sounds better, but still precocious. So, Peter, right? But I, I always tell my boys, you know, you look after me, I look after you, we work together as a team, and it all fits together. It's all part of cockpit resource management, isn't it, Todd? Yes, yeah. CRM, we call it for short. Big, big tool in aviation. <coughs> um, so yeah, a lot of passengers from all walks of life. Um, a lot of business passengers on this route. We get a lot of um, people from the mining contingent um, out in China and into Mongolia. We come come back fly there. We had a big Nokia contingent, um, mobile phones. In those days, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that rings a bell. Uh. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the rest of it, the, probably the passengers in world travel, the more, the more tourist, uh, tourist run. So we had um, quite a lot of tourists, a mixture between Chinese and English. So some were coming to Europe for, for a visit and others were going back home. And I, I do remember a little Chinese family I met during the flight. Um, I don't speak much Chinese. Um, Hello, goodbye, thank you, good deal, bad deal. That, that's it. Really. Um, that's all you need. So I was chatting to them, but they had a cute little boy. Um, and I, at the time, had three babies. All, th- all three of my boys were under three. So this little boy just, you know, I just wanted to say hello to him, 
So I said, Ni hao, and that's it. And he looked at me, what's that funny man in the striped uniform? But yeah, he, he was, you know, yeah, he was toddling up and down the aisle, enjoying something, had a blue, blue sweatshirt, I remember. And uh, yeah, I still think about that today, but they're, they're fine, they're fine. Um, and there was also one pregnant lady, she was 27 week pregnant. Um, she would she, come up to her limit uh, before she wouldn't be able to fly, so I remember there'd been a question asked about her just before departure. It's probably why I'm a minute late, actually, because I had to answer that query. But yeah, so she's, she's heavily pregnant, um, so I was concerned about her later on. So yeah, the route um, takes off out of Beijing, took off at 0209 Zulu, um, pretty much on time. So on your body clock, it's pretty much middle of the night. Um, but yeah, I had a good rest in the hotel the night before, so didn't feel too early. The sun's up, so that helps to, to get your circadian rhythm going. So took off at just past 02 Zulu, um, taking off towards the north, and straight over Mongolia. Uh, usually you get a good view of um, the Great Wall um, just after departure. Um, certainly from the flight deck, lovely, lovely views. <laughs> uh, yeah, over Mongolia and then um, over the Kutsk, um, that's near Lake Baikal for all the go, geologists among you miners. Um, I think Lake Baikal is, is a massive lake, isn't it? It's, got, it's the largest uh, freshwater lake. There you go. That's what I've got written down here. <laughs> 20% of the world's fresh water is held in one lake. Um, this was eight years ago. I think they've been using a lot of it. But, you know, I love, I love views like that. And you just fly over and you see this, this mining town of Irkutsk next to the lake. And it, it just looks horrible from the air. But it's probably greyer <laughs> and dustier on the ground, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, fly over there. Uh, past Krasnyarsk and follow follow the Siberian Railway route a little bit, and then you go over the river Ob, uh, north side of Moscow, about 300 miles north we were, then, and then um, into Europe. And actually, right overhead here on the day, um, that map's not exactly accurate, <coughs> on the day we came over just, uh, just over Copenhagen. So that's quite bizarre, I'm talking to you today. Um, so when we get over that sort of area, Denmark, on that route, we would all be back in the flight deck because we would have had some rest during the, during the flight because there's three of us. Um, so we'd have had about two, 45, three hour rests. Um, so we'd make sure we'd all be back in the flight with one hour to go and then we'd do another briefing. What did he call it? Certification. I'll call it a briefing because that's what I know. And, and again, it's, um, it, you're trying to share your picture of what you're expecting to happen at Heathrow. So you're, you're trying to create this mental model of the environment you're going to be flying into. So you'll be looking at the weather, uh, how much fuel you've got on board, all this jazz. So. It was a standard briefing on the day. Um, I think John, my first officer, was operating the flight that day. So he was operating as, uh, as the co-pilot, but he was flying the airplane. I was acting as his co-pilot, but obviously still being the captain in command of the whole the whole aircraft. So John briefed me for what he was expecting to land, and uh, it was all fine. We had loads of fuel. We were 20 minutes early, and yeah, what could go wrong? It's like lovely. So we, what we say in aviation speak is that on the sort of briefing, we we plan for the expected. So you, you can always plan that because you, you know roughly what's going to happen, so that's easy to plan for. But, but we also prepare for the unexpected. Now we never know quite what's going to happen, but we always try to prepare for something. So we maybe talk about a couple of scenarios per briefing about what might happen. But I certainly didn't talk about double engine failure, that's for sure. Um, and just, just think about Copenhagen, actually. Um, there's a human side to this story. Um, because I, I'd taken the last rest. So I'd come back in over Copenhagen for the briefing. Jumped into my seat. I'd been asleep for three hours, so I needed some food. So I had a, I had a salad. And I remember it had a, it sounds strange, but it had a red salsa dressing or something. Or, it was a red sauce anyway. And I put a napkin on. I didn't have my time on. 
put a napkin on because we really eat on our laps. It's like TV dinners and stuff like that. I sat there with this napkin on and it tucks in. Started eating. Chapter John. And I spilt a bit of sauce. And of course, what happens? The fact is that the napkin doesn't work. It's already fallen down. It goes straight down my shirt. This red sauce. And I'm like, I said to John, and I can't believe I said this to this day, but I said, we better not crash because they might think I've hurt myself because this looks like blood. Well, the look on John's face was like, you can't say that, you can't say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I said, well, okay. If we do, just make sure you, you remind me to put my time on it's going to cover it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, amazing. The little human story. I've never, I've never even said the word crash on a flight day. You know, people don't. It's a no-no. It's like, I don't mention thunderstorms because that frightens passengers. You, you call them rain clouds or you know, it's raining. But you, do, you certainly don't say thunderstorms because people imagine the worst. So it's certain things you don't talk about, um, but I did. And lo and behold, an hour later, the inevitable happened. So, approaching to London Heathrow to seven left. That's actually a picture of Mike, Mike, Mike. That was the registration. Golf Yankee Mike, Mike, Mike on the approach. So how, how did the event unfold? Very late on, um, basically. Um, so we've done the briefing. We had a quick hold. We talked about holding earlier. A quick hold around land on the north east side of London. Um, we had loads of fuel. But I did notice the fuel had uh, increased in temperature. I neglected to say, during the cruise, uh, over Siberia, the, the outside air temperatures dropped to minus 65 Celsius. Uh, it was very cold. Um, and our fuel temperature was dropping with it, because it's the fuel is stuck out in the wings, out in the open, basically, so it's going to cool down pretty quick. So we, we were keeping an eye on the fuel temperature. The limit was minus 47. That's, that's when they thought fuel froze, minus 47 degrees Celsius. So our limit was not to go below minus 44, which is pretty close. But if it gets colder than minus 44, you do things about it, like you descend into warmer air or you speed up, because friction helps to warm it up. We didn't have to do that, because we had a balmy minus 43 on the fuel gauge. Mm -hmm. However, when we got out of the landmark hole, coming through 20,000 feet, so about, um, about 10 minutes to landing, I, I do remember looking at the fuel gauge, and we had about 11 and a half tons, which is nearly two hours flying time in, in triple sevens. We had tons of fuel, but the fuel gauge warmed up. It was now minus 22. So yeah, that looked cool. You know, everything's fine. At 1,200 feet, we were all fat, dumb, and happy over Kew Gardens and Richmond. Uh, we were now fully configured for landing, so the gear down, full flaps. Landing checklist all done, and everything was good. So I was flying at this stage for John's approach. So I'm flying the the aircraft in autopilot, and we start picking up some gusty winds. And when when the wind blows on an aircraft, I'm sure you've all been, especially living up this part of the world, landing in in gusty wind conditions, the throttles on the Aircraft will go up and down to to keep the speed constant with the aircraft, but it must it does sound horrible down the back where you've got the engines thrusting and then retarding, thrusting, retarding. That's what was happening on this flight. It's normal, but I did share this again, sharing my mental model with John. I said, look, this isn't me. This is the auto throttles, so they do it on their own. So the auto throttles are doing that. I'm not being rough. So it's quite gusty out there. When you take control for your landing, just be mindful of that. Yeah, good. So 800 feet, he takes control. 720 feet, so three seconds after John's taken control, he, uh, so I've just relinquished control, so I'm now changing my paper plates, which are now on the iPad, so it's all different now. I was changing the page to the landing page. And I remember he says something to me, like, Pete, were the throttles doing this when you were flying? And I'm thinking, uh, yes, the, is it the gusty winds? Bit of a closed question, looking back, you know. It's, I could have worded it differently, but he's like, I don't know, I don't know. As he was talking 
to that lab. We were having an, an engine failure, but the aircraft didn't think we had an engine failure, so we had no warnings. What John was getting was the right engine thrust was increasing, increasing, to try and get more power. The aircraft didn't know there was a problem because the engine was actually just about turning over. It hadn't properly failed. So we, we had no warning, so it's like, yeah, okay, it's just the wind, it's just the gusty winds. So we're now at about 43 seconds. Sorry, a bit accurate here, but it's the way it goes. Every second counts. 43 seconds, we got uh, clearance to land call from the tower. Quite early on, actually. Uh, normally a lot lower than that. So it almost took me by surprise. I went, well, that's early. But there was nobody in front of us, so it was nice. So I then, um, I have to reply to that. I have to respond. And you heard that earlier on in the, in the tape uh, that I played you. So I give the clearance to land call. It all takes a couple of seconds to do all that. Flip the lights on, that's my, my cue that we're clear to land. Mm. And it, it all still feels fine, but the little... And this, this is interesting, I think it was... Um, I think it was Gordon. Someone was talking about having interruptions and... Didn't make a note about it. Distraction management is Fleming. Distraction management. This clearance to land call was a classic of that because John had started to share something that was happening to him. I then got interrupted by the ATC call to land, and the conversation was almost forgotten because we still had no, you know, we still had no warnings, but. <coughs> bit later on, the same thing was happening to the left engine. That was seven seconds after the right one. So John was starting to feel happier because the left engine was going through the same scenario as the right. So now you've got the right throttle almost full forward. The left starts to match it. So he's, he's thinking, oh, okay, this is, this is all going fine, but you know, there's an awful lot of power going on here. So he's not concerned about it anymore. I've sort of forgotten because he's not now verbalising anything that, that there's any problems. And there's still no warnings. But then it became clear that there was a big problem because John's hands were fully forward. I'm being the first officer now, I have to use left hand from the shoulders. So he was now fully arm stretched, which you never saw. I've never seen it in 12 years I've been on triple seven. Fully forward like that. But what got me was he said, help. Help Pete, I can't get any power. That's horrible. Wow. Uh, to hear the word help, in that sort of form of, you know, I never heard another pilot saying help to, to me. And it's like, what, what do you mean you can't get any power? So I'm, you know, back in the loop now. Um, and I look at his hand and it's fully forward. I'm like, well, that's, that's just wrong. I look at the engine instruments and I can see that he's asking for full power because the gauges are fully forward. The white lines is demanding full power. I'm like, well, that looks right. It's demanding full power. John's arm's fully forward, but there's something wrong with the gauge. There's no power in the engines. The gauge was blank. And it's like, well, that, that's wrong. But I couldn't understand what was wrong about the picture, because it had never happened. So it didn't make sense. And they both were the same, so it's like, Normally they're fully white. It's all shaded in, now they're black. So as my brain was trying to process this, John's verbalised to me, I've got a problem, help. I'm looking at the instruments going, something wrong with the instruments. My third pilot puts two, two together, he's got a good picture, and he goes, looks like we've got a double engine failure. And that was brilliant. It, it put it all, we were all working from the same song sheet. Then. And that made me think, I can't believe this is happening. So this disbelief was amazing. I still remember it now. It's like, but this can't happen. This is a triple seven, the most modern aircraft of its day. It's got so many redundancies. Why, why is this happening? You know, Todd talked about redundancies and, and spare capacities. And yeah, the triple seven has two generators per engine. So if one fails, it will use the backup one. 
You've got an APU generator in the back. So you've got five generators on the two engine aircraft. You've got spare engines. You've got spare fuel pumps for each fuel system. You've got so many redundancies in the safety line that it, it shouldn't happen that this was happening. And yet it was. So I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then a bit further down, 370 feet. It was happening. It was still, you know, nothing was sorted out because this was literally two seconds later. Um, I knew I had to do something about this. I was, I'd got over this disbelief, which probably lasted half a second because you, the aircraft's like, the, the runway's just there. It's, it's a mile and a half away. And weird. You know, less than 400 feet. So I knew I had to do something. I'm a captain. I'm, I've got these four bars on my shoulder for a reason, and, and they suddenly felt very heavy that day. I'd only been a captain for about four years, um, and I suddenly thought, this is down to me. I need to do something, because this is not a good situation to be in. I, just, I remember thinking, well, we just have to go around, which is a you know, missed approach. Uh, you know, all we have to do is put the power on and go around, and we'll sort this out. Um, that's what we'd have done in the simulator. Because you never get a double entry failure in the simulator. Certainly not one without any warnings. So I was like, no, we'll just go, we can't go around, we've got no power. I have to deal with this. I've, I have to deal with this approach. I have to deal with the runway being too far away. We're not going to make that. I, I suddenly realised that that runway is not achievable. So we are going to crash. It's inevitable. Is that a word again? And so I had to get over that. Right. What can I do? It's got to be a simple problem. There's no warnings, so maybe the, the warning system's US. It's got to be a simple fuel pump problem. So my first big decision was to leave John flying the aircraft. He was flying it already. It was much safer in my mind to leave him flying it whilst I sorted the problem out. So John, keep control. I'll sort this out. Thinking it was going to be a simple fuel pump problem. So. I mean, my hand went up, I did a quick scan for the top panel, checked all the fuel pumps were on, cross feeds, I switched the cross feed lines on, which basically extra pumps that run fuel from one wing to the other, just in case there was a, a fuel issue. Carried on down, all right, the pilot, that's, that's no use. Uh, thrust levers, yeah, they're still forward. Speed brake, that's not down, because if if the speed brake arm had come, for, come out and been activated, that's a massive amount of extra drag. So I made sure that was still up. Uh, I actually checked the fuel control switches were still on, so that's like your ignition, like your ignition on the car. I just checked they were still in the run position. And I checked the fire handles were still down. Because, <clears throat> I don't know, I thought if they popped up, they switched the engines off, but that hadn't been heard of. But I, I remember just putting my hand down on them to make sure they were in the correct position, and they were. And I remember thinking, for a fraction of a second, I've got no other idea what is going on. And we had no warnings. Still no warnings. I was like, this is modern aircraft. What is happening? Why is this happening to me? This happens to people you read about in the press. You know, it's never me, but it's always someone else. But today it's me. And, and that was really confusing until 270 feet, literally as I had my hand on that, those fire handles, the first warning came up, airspeed low. And suddenly this quietness, which had been for the last 10 seconds, was obliterated by this horrible master caution warning. I'm like, oh my God, the, the warning system is still working. So I cancelled the noise and shouted out, airspeed low basically meant to John, do not get any slower because we are back at stall speed. Because what had happened in the last four seconds or so was that we had no power, so the aircraft was coming down and down, but keeping on the same glide path. So it was having to reduce its speed to keep the same height and getting a higher and higher angle of attack, but bleeding off its speed in the process. So we were now back at a horrible 10 degrees nose up at attitude at minimum speed for the configuration we were at. So if we went any slower, continued down this slope, we would just stall and fall down. So this warning was saying, 
The warning's still working, guys. Don't go any slower. So John did a good job. He dipped the nose down. It's because we needed the speed. If we didn't have the speed, we'd just stall. So he did a good job, started dropping the nose. Then I look out the front, like, where are we going to get to? Because we're crashing. But we're not going to get anywhere near the runway. Certainly not now. And I realised that how far we were going to get was this block of buildings, a catering block, short of London Heathrow, uh, a place called Hatton Cross. Uh, there's also the nasty BP petrol station there, which wouldn't have been good. But this building um, was in my face. I was still low, but it was that's where we were going into, that was our projection. I looked down at the vertical speed, how fast we're going in the in the vertical plane, that was a horrible 1,800 feet a minute. Normally, it would be 750. So we were plummeting down uh, rather than a gentle glide. Well, 1,800 feet a minute, that's horrible. And mm -hmm. where we're going to impact, that's, that's 100%. Of my passengers, dead. Uh, you don't want to hit a building at, at 140 miles an hour. Uh, and I remember thinking quite clearly, not about myself or my co-pilot, I remember thinking about my, my customers. I thought, everyone's dead. If we hit that building, we're all dead. I never came into the appraisal, which I found quite interesting. Because um, I always said to guys, anyone who was <coughs> concerned about flying, I said, don't worry about flying, because we, we fly the simulators all the time. And we put us through all sorts of scenarios, engine failures, it's no problem. We, we fly through anything, fires, and we always get the simulator down. So it's, if we get the simulator down, then the rest of the plane will follow. So you'll be safe. But when it actually hit the fan, I, I wasn't actually thinking about myself. I became a, some sort of robot. And I was, I was just there in a calm manner, trying to work through the options. And I was worried about my passengers. And I often look back at that and think, if I'd been concerned about myself, I think I might have got into some sort of panic mode and got stressed about it and not been able to think clearly. So, but it's not nice to know you're going to kill all the passengers who put their trust in you. So, what can I do? <coughs> what can I do about that? <coughs> Still had 20 seconds to go. So, I know I'm waffling a lot, but it's all what was going through my head. Um, time really does slow down when you're in a stressful environment. It, I guess the adrenaline just pumps faster and it, your brain seems to work three times as fast. But it's about 20 seconds to go. That's, that's quite a lot of time, really. But this building was looking awfully close. Um, I wasn't looking, wasn't looking like I liked you know, the thought of going into that. And then my training kicked in. I thought, right, okay, what can we do? Um, and I used one tool we would use in the simulator all the time is, is a DODAR. You know, um, basically, DODAR stands for diagnose the problem. What options have you got? Decide on your option, um, and then you um, assign the task and review. And that's DODAR. I, I, I don't like it, but anyway, it's, it's what we use. I didn't have time to use that tool. I mean, that's an awful lot. And, and you would usually share that, obviously, with your crew. Um, another tool that we use a lot is CRM, Cockpit Resource Management. And we stole that from NASA. I think I'm right in saying that. Yeah. Um, and British Airways have been using it ever since I joined 27 years ago. So we, we use CRM big time in the simulator. That's all about using everybody in the flight deck and saying, like, what do you think the problem is? Yeah, I think it's that as well. I think we've got a double engine failure. What options have we got? Uh, well, I think we could uh, restart the engine. <laughs> yes, possibly. Uh, we could crash, yeah. Uh, we could, you know, we can't go around. You know, so you, you play around like that. Well, we didn't have time for that nice, nicety, nicety CRM stuff. That, that was my biggest tool. I, I always felt in the sim that was where I excelled. And suddenly that was taken away from me. And I, I felt robbed of my best tool. I remember being angry about that. I mean, this isn't right. I just wanted a simple emergency. An engine failure would have been perfect, not two. You know, it, it was angry. Um, 
So I, I, I had to ditch most of the dodo, and I just went for the options. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's the only time I've got. And I had no time even to verbalise, because verbalising takes ages, you know, listen to me tonight. Um, so, but interestingly, after this event, they changed dodo to t dodo, and the t stands for time available. And of course, even if it had t in front of this, I'd have said, well, zero. But nowadays, in the simulator, we go, well, I've got 30 minutes, because I've got loads of fuel, so we've got 30 minutes to think about decisions and options as well. I didn't. So I went straight for the options, and it, it became quite clear to me I had <coughs> one option would be to raise the gear up, because that's the biggest form of drag, because this was all about trying to get further but without any power available. So the only way to get further in an aircraft or a bird, so a feathered bird is to stretch it, is, is to reduce the amount of drag you've got. So a bird's feet, if you might, or you know, aircraft's undercarriage hanging down, that's a big amount of drag. So if you raise that up, or if you're landing on water like the Hudson, you want to raise the gear up and you've got a nice you know, slimline belly, or you've got less drag. And I thought, no, I can't do can't do the gear because we're going to crash and I need to crash on the gear. Because crashing on land, you need the gear because it takes the brunt of the impact. So right, gear options out. What else have I got? Flaps. So my, uh, my option to change the flap, which has become my pièce de résistance, I suppose people know me, for changing the flap. Is Pilots, even commercial pilots today say, how did you think about that? And I tell them in about five minutes <laughs> that it was my only option left. I had to reduce that land flap from 30 to 25 degrees. But we were, if you remember, we were already back at uh, airspeed low speed, so we were back at the stick shaking speed. So it was, the stick shaker was operating, it actually warns you two ways, it gives you a verbal noise, Hello, so question. Flap change. Uh, Sorry, I've got all techy. Yeah. Okay, flaps are the uh, piece of equipment that hangs out the back of the aircraft. So it makes the wing larger. So, you uh, yeah, it, yeah. so takeoff, we use a little bit, yeah. gives you more lift. Landing, we use a lot more because we can fly slower. Bernoulli's theorem, basically, it makes the wing larger and you can float down like a bird. It's lovely. Except when you've got full land flap and it gets very draggy, and I needed to reduce that. So I, this was my well, my, spare, my my second big decision really was right flaps, and we're pretty low. That that's like gosh, I don't know, 20, 15 seconds or so ago. I thought if I don't move this flap lever, we're going to hit that building and 100% fatalities. If I move it to flat 25 and we stall, then we drop and everybody dies. If I move it and it works, like I think it will work, I might save some people. So what, <coughs> what, what choice would you make? You'd move it. Because that's the only one that gives you a chance of saving people. But I remember, my hand went down, again, I couldn't talk to John about it because of <laughs> the time constraints. So my hand went down to the flat lever, and another training tool came in my head, and I thought, I've been told not to move. If you're having to move part of the aircraft that is to do with flying safely, which flaps is, count to six slowly. If you've got to move that on your own, you haven't got someone else to confirm with count to six slowly. So give yourself some time, make sure it's the correct thing to do. So I remember putting my hand on that flat lever thinking, count to six, well, I haven't got time to count to six. I've got to move it. And I moved it, and the relief was, was, was fantastic because what happened was our rate of descent went from 1,800 feet a minute, the drag reduced, John was able to raise the nose slightly, and our rate of descent went to 1,200 feet a minute. Mm -hmm. So it was about halfway between normal and the, and the worst. It was like, fantastic. So this building, which had been sat on the horizon coming straight towards us, now started to go below, which means you're going to go above it. Fantastic. 
So I thought, we're still going to crash course, but I now thought, I've just saved people. And I had these figures in my head, and I clearly remember them. 50% I thought, that's brilliant. And I felt so elated, as you can in that situation, but I remember feeling I've done something good here. But then, 200 feet, so a little bit later, yeah, second or two, still had some usable time, 10 seconds. Well, in this scenario, that's, that's an immense amount of time. So I thought, right, uh, I felt good, I'm doing some good things here. John's happy. Can see he's still flying it well. So what else can I do? I've got I've got ten seconds of usable time. Two hundred feet is a it's a classic altitude for pilots. It's the time when you would in an emergency. It's the time when you would be telling your passengers to brace. So it's that sort of late on. But they'd have been briefed at that point. I had had no time up to this point to talk to my cabin crew or the passengers or even ATC at this point. It, it was so fast. These last 20 seconds have been rapid. So I was now down to this, this point thinking, what can I do? And I've got another mnemonic, training, again, PPP. I, I don't think I've heard it for about 15 years, but some trainer had said, if you're ever short of time and you want a really quick, helpful tool, it's a bit like Doda, use PPP. It stands for Plain Path People. They're easy to remember, and that's the importance of having time-constrained tools like this. They've got to snap in your head straight away. This one did, even, even in these situations. So I thought, plane path people, yeah, I'll use that. Plane, right, well, I've done what I can, I can't sort that out. Path, I've sorted that out, I've changed the flat. People, of course, what should I do? Shall I do a brace ball? It's 200 feet, mm, perfect. But I, I remember thinking, all in the split seconds, my passengers haven't been briefed, they haven't been rebriefed for 11 hours on the brace position. Half of them are Chinese. They won't understand if my cabin crew starts shouting, brace, brace, them. they'll all be sitting up and wondering what's going on. So I thought, they're sat there thinking we're going to do a normal landing. They're all relaxed. You know, they've all had a, a, long, a long journey. Their bodies have started to emaciate anyway. It's like a Navy SEAL. So I thought, leave them, leave them happy. Um, and it, it was probably a... <coughs> A different, difficult call for me. I mean, a lot of this is in the grey area. The, this whole flap change with no procedures to follow because it was unwritten, yeah. unprecedented. But, so I, I'd been in this grey area for 20 seconds and I had to develop, you know, I, I was at the pointy end and the blunt end of your stick. Yeah. I was having to do everything. And it, yeah, it was quite tricky, really, but that's the grey area. I, I was in one, yeah. big time. Um, but this PPP was, was very useful in the end um, <coughs> I thought, people I won't do that race ball because I don't want to hurt people because uh, East Midlands crashed uh, it's a bit pilot speak now but they, they switched the wrong engine off and they ended up uh, the, the good engine that they'd shut down uh, they shouldn't have done seen their bad engine so they were flying on, finally conked out um, short of the runway, and they crashed short into the side of the motorway. They had a lot of fatalities, but they reckon a lot of them were badly injured because of the brace position. And it was wrong in those days, or it's different from how we do it now. People used to interlock their hands. You know, you should never do that. It's because you, if you crash, your arms can't go anywhere. So always put palm on top of palm when you head, so then your arms can separate. And if that's all you take out, that's great. You know, I might have saved someone's arm. Um, and feet position was slightly different. So I thought, I, I want to get away from that whole grace ball. What I'll do is I'll do a mayday call. Because I've only got a chance to do one. I can't do a PA and a mayday call. We're about to crash. I want to get the emergency services en route to me because I might not survive this. And that, that was my first time I thought about myself. And I thought, we're going to crash, possibly in the road, but definitely not on the runway. And I need those emergency services to come out as soon as possible. If I don't survive, they're going to take an extra minute or two. So I, need, I wanted them to come out straight away. So I did, I did a mayday call. And then we hit the deck. Um, I was still talking on the RT as we hit. Um, it was quite bad actually, quite a bad landing. 
I'm, not, I'm never giving John another landing. It was, you know, <laughs> it's one of the worst. A normal landing distance would be 1,800 metres on the runway, sort of average stopping distance. So 1.8 kilometres. This was a 370 metre stop. So it was um, about 20% of the normal rollout distance. And it was so hard, I actually thought we had breached the hull down the back. So I still thought 20% including my little Chinese boy. I didn't think he'd made it. Um, so I sort of thought 20% off. 20% fatalities, which was uh, much better than 20 seconds before. So <coughs> things were, you know, still good, but it was sad, sad moment. We get to the evacuation, and of course, we, we were plummeting down those garden furrows there. And that, that's where I became a passenger, because I you can't do anything to an aircraft when it's skidding along the ground. So I became a passenger at that point. I, I remember that feeling that, oh, this is, this is where I finish. This is where I end. And I... <laughs> so I, I actually said goodbye to Maria and my three boys as we were trundling down the grass. And then we stopped. I, I, didn't, I didn't pick up the phone and phone me. So I, in my head, I said goodbye. Um, and then we stopped and I felt a bit foolish for thinking I was about to die and I didn't. I remember that. It's like, oh, that was a bit silly. Um, and you see, we, we sort of made the runway, just. Um, <laughs> but then it, then it became a normal scenario. Then it became a simulator. And I was back at the grey area. I, I, was, I was now in a comfort zone. I know it sounds odd, but this is what we're trained for. This was a, now a normal occurrence. So I was back in the simulator mode. Oh, okay, this is an evacuation. And it all became transparent. Like, well, I'll do this then, I'll do this now. You know, I'll ask the checklist and we run through it. We all come together at the end. Have you done your drills? Right, let's get out, let's look after ourselves. And that was a nice, a nice feeling. It, we were comforted by being back in the simulator, back in a, a normal environment, if that can be normal. But it did feel reasonably normal. <coughs> Still horrible, but you know, good news was everyone got off. Um, all down the all sides worked. Everybody got off. Um, and I remember coming down that door one right <coughs> side. Fire chief was at the bottom, and he he said, to, "You know, you the captain." Because I didn't have my tie on. Are <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Um, and he says. <coughs> Have you got any dangerous goods in the hold? Or like, no, we're fine. There's 152 passengers on the crew on board. Um, how many? I think I said how many have I killed? It, it was worded slightly wrong, but I think I was a bit stressed. Um, and he, he looked at me puzzled and went, "No, everybody's off." I went, "Yes, but how many are dead?" And he said, "No, I don't know how you've done it, but everyone's alive." That, that was a massive, massive relief to me. Uh, fantastic feeling. So what actually happened? Uh, I talked about the fuel getting very cold during the flight. It never hurt, you know, AIB investigators hadn't got an idea. It took them two years to investigate this, this event. They didn't know that this could happen. So the first, the first time they saw it was when they took the whole of the fuel pipe of 777 to Edwards Air Force Base in Florida, which was the biggest hangar they could find that they could actually freeze. Um, so they took this, this whole fuel pipe down to this big freezer and they put it through the ten and a half hour flight and they pumped exactly the amounts of fuel that we pumped through the pipes and exactly the same temperatures that we went through. And then after ten and a half hours they cut the pipe and that's what they found. And that is ice formed from perfectly good fuel and they, they didn't know it could happen. It was Korean fuel actually, they, they started blaming the Chinese but actually they realised that this fuel would come from Korea and it would be tanked up to Beijing. And it was some of the best fuel because they had a, a whole wing full of it so they were testing it. And they said this is the best fuel we've ever seen. But it, they said it, it just performs brilliantly but it, it gets a bit viscous, I think it was minus 10 to minus 20 it starts getting viscous. Then it starts levelling off again between minus 20 and minus 30. And then between minus 30 and minus 40, it starts getting viscous again. So they were like, we didn't know this happened to fuel, but now we do, and we can do something about it, and we can make the world a safer place. 
Because this had happened a few times before, but it had cleared before landing. So nobody knew this thing, this ice disappears. So the culprit is gone. You know, it's, Elvis has left the room. So that's why they, they didn't find it on, on landing, because it had gone. It melted. The fuel, well, they realised what happened. The ice had formed in the fuel pipe during the flight. When we went through the gusty winds over Kew Gardens, so when I was flying it, it's my fault, I know, throttles were going up and down. What they found happened is during the gusts, big amounts of power went on. The fuel demand from the engines demanded more, more fuel to power the engines. That extra amount of fuel dislodged the slightly warmed up minus 20 sludge, uh, sludge and it just hit this piece of equipment, the FOHE, which is the first component of the Rolls Royce engine. Um, that's basically full of 300 little capillaries you can just see at the top. But the ice there blocked 95% of those capillaries. So it, it was like a slush puppy, and the engines couldn't suck the fuel through that ice quick enough to power them. And that's why the warning systems said there's no warnings because they, they were getting just a trickle of fuel to keep them turning, but not enough to provide any power. So that was why it was all a bit confusing. I always feel like I need to take a breath. I was there at the dinner, and Peter was amazing. And actually, we talked for hours and hours. Um, it, 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 I wanted you to hear this, because I wanted you to hear the operator talk about the failure and really tell the story, the context-rich explanation of how this event happened, and even more importantly, what his mindset was. And and I know it was long. I, I'm sorry about that. I, I don't know what to cut, so it was difficult. And I know it was hard to hear, but I think the payoff in the long run is that you got to hear him say some, some things that I think are pretty important. When training matters and when it doesn't. What mnemonic tools come to mind and how some of them are developed in a scenario that allows the luxury and capacity to have time and how others are developed and there's just no time to use them. And how things like crew resource management, which is a tool they lean on, was not there until it was there. Uh, to me, the most interesting thing is when he said, I was the passenger on the plane. And then after we crash landed, I was relieved because it was normal again. These are things we simulate. Having the ability and the capacity to recover is everything. And I think Peter's story is amazing. I want to especially thank Denmark Oil and Gas or Oil and Gas Denmark uh, for the uh, permission to use this. But mostly I want to thank you for listening to it. I think this is a remarkable podcast. Um, listen to it a couple times. It, it's worth it just just for us. It's, it's so important to hear that mindset and context of an event that happened. So um, learn something new every day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe.